Bert Rutan is definitely a genius. There is literally nobody on the planet that can come close to him. He has, he has designed kit planes. He has designed aircraft that have hauled rocket ships up to 50,000 feet. He designed the, the Voyager. And all of these aircraft, just a few of them you see there, have all been extremely successful in the, in the particular application for which they were designed. He does, in fact, design aircraft that for a wide variety of, of uh, pilots. The Very Easy was extremely well received, and he became literally an aviation star with that one aircraft alone. The Beach, the Beach Starship was a beautiful aircraft that was developed for Beach Aircraft Corporation, and it featured swept wings, winglets, a, a canard, and engines in the back. White Knight was an aircraft that hauled a, a spaceship on the belly of the airplane hauled it up to 50,000 feet, and it released from there and was the first time anybody had ever gone up into space and come right back down again and then reused that vehicle within a two-week period of time, and he won what is called the Ansari X Prize of $10 million for being able to use that particular spaceship two times within a two-week period. Okay, let's go back here. Okay, here's Rutan's earliest design. It was an all wood called a very, very Vigan. Um, it wasn't a real popular aircraft, but it was his first one. This is typical of Rutan's designs because it has what is called a canard. Now the canard is the front is the front wing it's called, front wing, canard, C A N A R D. That makes an airplane impossible to stall. That's an important point. One of the things I want you to remember now is as we get on in the semester, I'll be saying things that are important that aren't necessarily in the PowerPoint presentation. So you need to be aware to make those notes, even though you don't see it in print on the screen. That canard prevents the aircraft from stalling. This is a fascinating, this is the fascinating aircraft that won him the $10 million Ansari Prize. And here is the spaceship underneath. The spaceship is hung underneath there. This, this, air, this aircraft with the wings and the funny front wheels way up, in the, way up here, that spacecraft was dropped off at 50,000 feet, rocketed up to 352,000 feet, which is the beginning of space, and then came back down successfully. And he was able to use that same combination of that twin-engine airplane plus that spaceship two weeks later, that was the requirement for the Ansari X Prize of $10 million. He had to be able to do it two weeks in a row. I mean, twice within a period of two weeks. It, it, it's, a, it's an awkward-looking combination, but you can see that, that that particular aircraft that's hauling him up there has two jet engines. This one has, it's, it's literally a rocket. It had enough fuel on board to rocket it up to what is called the edge of outer space. One of the things that we'll get into is airspace designations later on. And the beginning of space, where we don't own it anymore, we don't own the space above our, air, uh, above our land, is 352,000 feet. So the question is, how high does controlled airspace go in every country of the world? It goes up to the edge of 352,000 feet. From there on, by, 
by international convention, it's outer space, not controlled by anybody. There's the Voyager on its first test flight. What's interesting about it is that it has engines in the rear, engines in the front, engine in the front, engine in the rear, and this is the cockpit in the cabin in the center. Fuel is distributed throughout the entire frame. And you, again, you can see can, the canard up front here, which prevents that aircraft from stalling. There's a look at underneath. <clears throat> when they flew, as soon as they got up to altitude, which is not terribly high, as soon as they got up to altitude, they shut off the front engine, and they used the rear engine for the entire nine-day trip in, in uh, going around the world. We're going to be taking a look at the route they flew, and we'll look at other pieces of good information about it. You can see that the only... The only way they could look out was through the side windows. What kind of aircraft also had that problem? Hmm? Spirit of St. Louis? Yeah. Remember Spirit of St. Louis? He could only look out the side windows. He couldn't look out the windows in front. So in many ways, Bert Rutan copied Charles Lindbergh when he went around the world, when he went across the Atlantic Ocean in... Uh, Spirit of St. Louis. Okay, let's look at some of the details. This, to me, is the most fascinating piece of information. These the fact that that fairly large an aircraft weighed only 2,250 pounds. That's probably... Not much, not much less than your automobile weighs. It was made of carbon fiber, fiberglass, and some of it was honeycomb. That was, I mean, you took a honeycomb like, like a, a bee's hive, and you covered it with carbon fiber, graphite, and, and then put fiberglass on top of that. That made it extremely light but extremely strong. But this is, the, this is the piece of information that is absolutely mind-boggling to me, and that is that the fuel on board weighed three and a half times the entire aircraft weight. Normally in a light aircraft, a light aircraft will weigh, let's say, 3,600 pounds, and the fuel at best would weigh 420 pounds. That's a typical aircraft like I fly. So the fuel in that particular case is only a fraction of the total weight of the airplane. Here, the fuel is just enormously more heavy or heavier than the aircraft itself. Then you add in the two pilots and some food and water for them. And what you get is a significant weight being lifted off the ground. They had 17 fuel tanks located all around the fuselage, the wings, and the empennage of the Voyager. So the gross takeoff weight was nearly 10,000 pounds, 7,000 of which was fuel. This is not a significant factor, uh, the wingspan of 111 feet, but it does become significant in their attempts to take off because the wings themselves were so heavy and so long that they dragged on the runway. And that's another thing we'll cover here in my presentation. We'll, we'll actually show you a video of them taking off from Edwards Air Force Base. The material was composite. Bert Rutan was probably the major 
designer in the world of composite material. And now, as you remember, Boeing 787 has what percentage of composites? 50. 50 percent, right? So you could almost say that if it wasn't for Burt Rutan, Boeing might not be even in the composite field because most of the world's testing of composite aircraft was done by Burt Rutan and his pilots. The two engines were made by Teledyne Continental Motors, and that you can actually go out here in the warehouse, and a couple of those Cessnas have Continental Motors in them. They're nothing more than a little piston engine. One was 110 horsepower, and the other, I think, was 140 horsepower. Nothing significant about it. My airplane, my Piper Dakota, had a 235 horsepower. But theirs, 110 in the back and 140 in front, were nothing. It was just barely to keep them in the air and not use up a lot of fuel. So the one in the back, which was 110 horsepower, is the one that kept them aloft. And that's really all they wanted to do. They really didn't have much option. If they wanted to climb, they had to, they had to plan so far in advance that they would start climbing a couple of hours before they had to get to a certain altitude. It took five years to build and test before it took off. And this is just a, a synopsis of the flight. The takeoff was on December 14, 1986. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the return was nine days, 44 minutes, and three seconds later. Nine days, total of 216 hours in the air. And the landing was just before Christmas in 1986. This was not as thrilling as the landing on the moon, but it occupied the minds of nearly everybody in the United States because the networks, the TV networks, covered it every single day for the nine days they were in the air. Now, they didn't do it all day long like they did with the landing on the moon, because I can tell you that you couldn't find anything on TV other than the landing on the moon, right? But here, they would break in and say that it was having trouble because of weather, or it had to make a sharp turn, or it couldn't climb up because of whatever. So they would come in and give you that information, but the networks did, in fact, cover it for the nine days. Okay, let's look at some of the details of the flight. The first one, as far as the pilots are concerned, it was an extremely tight cockpit. As you can see, his head barely touches the top of the cockpit. You couldn't stand up in it. You had, to, you had to crawl back behind the cockpit in order to get back and, and get some rest. And the other pilot had to crawl forward, and you had to, you had, they had to crawl sideways from one another as they passed in the fuselage. That's how tight the fuselage was. Right now, it's only as tight as my arms extended out like this. That was it. That's the only room they had in that, in that uh, cockpit, in that whole fuselage. No room to stand. They did have some pretty good instruments, some instruments that at the time were pretty, pretty technologically advanced, like this multifunction display. That's called an MFD, multifunction display, and it's being used today on nearly every aircraft produced, whether it's a small aircraft like a Cirrus or a large aircraft like a corporate jet, you almost are never going to see again the round gauges installed on brand new aircraft. 
it's kind of a thing of the past. They may have a few of them left. Some of the bush plains up in Alaska may still have some of those round gauges, but for the most part, what you're going to see on almost all light aircraft, and even from then on all the way up, are what we call multifunction displays. Most of them would be Garmin or some other brand. Garmin is one of those companies that saw the future and began to develop these kinds of displays well in advance of other manufacturers, and so they have captured a pretty significant share of the industry. Dick Rutan is Bert Rutan's brother. When he was talking about going around the world, no sponsor would listen to him. No sponsor wanted to be a part of it because they thought for sure that it was impossible or highly dangerous, and they didn't want to be associated with an attempt that was going to fail. And most major manufacturers, with the exception of Continental Motors, stayed out of the picture. They didn't want any part of it. So Dick and Jenna, Gina, decided to go with the project, and so they went out and they, they organized a, a, a foundation and were able to get enough money from people who didn't necessarily want to be identified. They got enough money to build and test the aircraft and then got additional money to, to let it fly around the world. Now, of course, when they got back, um, the people who stuck with it um, really were rewarded in many ways, like Continental Motors, of course, because their, their two engines powered that aircraft around the world. The flight began at Edwards Air Force Base and ended at Edwards Air Force Base. Does anybody know where Edwards Air Force Base is? In the Mojave Desert, that's correct. It's fairly close by. You can actually take a drive out someday. If you and your parents want to just drive somewhere for a, a few hours one way, drive to the Mojave Airport. That's where all the major technological developments are taking place in the world of aviation. There are at least ten major companies there, including Burt Rutan's company, Scale Deposits, Scaled Composites, that that are working on various aspects of aviation. In fact, three of my glider students, that is students who graduated from Cal Poly, got their glider license with me, are now working in Mojave at, at several of those different organizations. It's, it's an it's a, um, amazing place. You can actually wander around the airport. It doesn't have quite the security that you would find at FAT. You can visit these different businesses. You can walk into a hangar. You can look at these aircraft being built. Okay, this is the Los Angeles sectional, and I just want you to know where Edwards Air Force Base is. Edwards Air Force Base is right here. This is Bakersfield. This is Mojave right here. This is the Los Ange mountains north of Los Angeles. Obviously, the Central Valley up here, Tulare, Visalia. This is a restricted area, as you can see. But this is where all the activity took, takes place. And in addition to that very long runway, they also can land on the dry lake bed. So they can actually take advantage of not only the runway, the hard surface runway, but they can have extension overruns or they can land prior to the hard surface runway. Jacob? Oh, because they're doing a lot of research. They're doing a lot of research out here. This is China Lake Naval Weapons Station right here, this airport. Remember we talked about color can give you a lot of good information. So an airport that is blue has a control tower. An airport that is magenta does not have a control tower. So here's an airport here that does not have a control tower, but China Lake does. This is no control tower. This is a control tower. So blue and magenta have different meanings, as we talked about before. And also, the boundaries around airspace, and we'll get into that in one of these lectures coming up, the boundaries around airspace are either going to be blue, solid blue, solid magenta, dash blue, and dash magenta. 
You can see here they have a dash blue around Edwards Air Force Base. And these are the mountains, the Sierra Nevada, right? And all the yellow means high-density cities, high-density cities. But out here, whenever, we're, whenever I'm going to fly, say, to back to Chicago, I usually have to fly down from Fresno. I come across here around Lake Isabella. I come around the bottom of this restricted area at Edwards Air Force Base, come over here to Barstow, and then on up into, into uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois. Yeah. So everybody get an idea of where that is. Huh? If you're ever traveling out that way, if you ever have to drive to uh, Phoenix or you have to drive to the river, the Colorado River, and you have enough time, if you have an extra hour, stop by the Mojave Airport. It is literally the heartbeat of technological aviation development. Okay, so the, the actual takeoff itself took nearly three minutes, which is probably the longest takeoff in recorded history. Even Charles Lindbergh took only a minute or so, maybe even a minute and a half, to get off the runway at Roosevelt Field on his way to Paris. It is extremely unusual to be on the runway trying to take off for three full minutes. Now, they could do it because they weren't rapidly accelerating on the runway, and they could do it because the runways themselves were that long and that safe, but it still took an enormous amount of time. On the way, and you'll see that in the video, the wingtips were rubbing on the ground. They were rubbing on the runway. And on, under both wingtips, they actually shaved off parts of the fiberglass, and one wingtip that had what we call a winglet, which is a little vertical piece of things that looks like a blade, that was taken off completely. So they were flying with a slightly unbalanced wing, because once you get rid of that winglet, it changes the drag on that wing. It increases the drag on that wing. That means that that the, the airplane's always going to want to yaw towards the wing that had the winglet come off, right? Because the drag is going to be greater on that wing, so that wing's going to be want to be pulled back away from the relative wind. Okay, let's see if we can get this started. Not very long, about four minutes or so. Seven thirty a.m. at Edwards Air Force Base. The December morning is cold, and ice keeps forming on the wings. They have to be continually defrosted. The Voyager's designer, Bert Rutan, sits in his twin-engine Duchess with pilot Mike Melville. They will follow Voyager through takeoff and the first four hours of flight. At eight a.m., Edwards Tower gives the all clear. The takeoff roll begins. Takeoff speed is around 90 knots, and a speed of 100 knots is critical for Voyager to climb with the full fuel load. Gina Yeager calls off the speed and the distance covered down the runway. As the airplane started to move down the runway, I didn't know if it was controlled. I didn't know for sure whether it could get off in that much runway. Uh, I didn't know whether the landing gear would take the banging of the ruts and the concrete at that weight. At first, everything's fine, but then the fuel-laden wingtips begin to literally fly downwards and scrape on the runway surface. There is confusion. Neither Dick nor Gina realize what is happening to the wingtips. Wait a minute, I need to hear her call. Head on view showing the aircraft. You can see the wings 
finally getting another win. No one had ever thought that, that it would drive itself down into the ground like it did. And it was terrifying watching the wings grind away, knowing it was fuel right at the wing tips almost. It was so far And hearing Gina's fact, voice come out, she was counting was the 100 crash. yards as they were going, and it was just this real steady, almost monotone voice. I, I was thinking to myself, how can she do this? You know, I mean, unbelievable. The thrill of seeing the wing finally radius. lift and then finally bend and then lift off. Wow. <laughs> and then the magic hundred knots is reached. Hundred knots! Hot damn! We got out in front! Woohoo! The fact that we were able to accelerate to a hundred knots told me as a performance engineer, got it made for performance. It was almost like I didn't think it could happen. But it, damn it, it happened. You know, got a hundred knots. Voyager is off the, right, off the ground and climbing. climbing. Now, now it's time to assess the damage to the wing tip. It's being tested. Okay, so that, that's, that's it for that particular video. But it just goes to show you that things happen, and they didn't understand why they happened. I mean, here we are with the wings actually were driven down hardly, hard onto the runway, and they didn't quite understand that. In my opinion, they were sitting in a way that there was virtually no angle of attack. In fact, if you look at it carefully, you might be able to see that it was a negative angle of attack where the nose gear was slightly down, probably because of the fuel weight. The main gears were okay, but the nose gear was probably down a little bit. That meant they had a negative angle of attack. I think if they had pulled back on the stick just a little bit to raise the nose slightly up off the nose gear, I think they would have had enough angle of attack to lift those wings off the runway. Now, I guess they didn't want to do that for a variety of reasons. I'm, I'm second-guessing them, and I'm not even an aeronautical engineer, so you can... You can take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But it was just, it was an amazing departure. But that was only the beginning of what they went through around the world. And I'm going to show you, there's a beautiful com a route map coming up with the different things that happened to them en route around the world. When I say politics, I mean that they had to be very careful not to violate airspace that they did not have permission to go through. One of those airspaces was Vietnam. They just didn't have, they did not have the permission. And that's not the only one. There were other ones. You know, when my young guy, everybody remember I talked about my, my young student who went around the world by himself? He, he probably had 50 to 60 permissions that they had to get ahead of time in order to fly through various countries' airspaces. Yeah, at least 50 or 60, something in that, on, that, on that order. And the same with, with uh, the Voyager. The Voyager had to get permission to go through people's airspace or even near their airspace. And one of the problems is, and you'll see it in the route map, they were facing tornadoes. They were facing not tornadoes, but thunderstorms that were, that were in a position to create tornadoes. So one of the big problems they had was dodging thunderstorms. And the route map will show that. When I show you the route map coming up here, you'll be able to see what they were faced with in terms of, and there was also a typhoon they had to go around. Remember, Amelia Earhart was going to attempt the round the world flight, and her expected distance was 29,000 miles. You know, when she got around Howland Island, or whatever she thought was a Howland Island, she had only flown 22,000. She had 7,000 to go. 
But here they expected to go 25,000. What's the circumference of the Earth at its maximum? If you fly around the equator, how many miles are you going to fly? Anybody? Out loud? Pardon? No, generally about 25,000, close to 25,000. think the circumference is 24 and some odd number that I don't remember because it's not critical for me. You may remember that exactly. I don't. Okay, here's the route of flight. And what we'll see here in a minute is... Now, there's some way to zoom in here, and I'm not sure what that is. If somebody knows, by all means, let me know. Okay, sorry about that. I thought for sure that there was a way to, to zoom in on this, on this slide. In fact, I can't even hardly read it. Anyway, they took off, they took off from here at Edwards Air Force Base. Then they went out over the water, and they dodged right away. They dodged two thunderstorms. And then they continued flying. They got to the Hawaiian Islands right here. And they wound up meeting with a chase plane. And I'm not sure what the chase plane was doing out there at the Hawaiian Islands, but it was out there. They continued on past another thunderstorm. Then it says Voyager flew between the feeder bend and the main part of the, of the, the typhoon. It went right through there in, in order to get a good strong tailwind. When it got to this point, it says the autopilot failed. They went over the Philippines. Now they're trying to go through a mass of thunderstorms. This entire area here is all bad weather. This is Vietnam here. They had to kind of squeeze between the thunderstorms and Vietnam. Down at the bottom, by the way, if you're looking at the bottom, this is a profile view showing the change in altitude. And at one point you can see over here that they, did, they had to get a certain height over the uh, eastern side of the African continent. Anyway, going back over here, they had, they had a chase plane set over here in this area, and the, air, the chase plane was not allowed to take off. I don't know what reason, probably political, or maybe it was weather, and they couldn't get a takeoff clearance. So they were going to rendezvous with it, but, but the chase plane couldn't get off. So they continued on just to the south of the, of the Indian the Indian continent, again, weather factors in here. Then they, this is an, a squall line, a huge squall line that we see often in the mid part of the United States that is filled with thunderstorms and tornadoes, heavy rain, extreme turbulence. So they were concerned about flying through restricted airspace. Now, what they did is they also made a mistake. They, they mistake, mistaked, mistaked the morning star for a particular heading that they were supposed to take up. Then they crossed over the, the African peninsula, I mean the, part, the southern part of Africa, again going over the highest spot that they had to go over for the entire trip. When it what happened right here, it says there they discovered that there was a backwards fuel flow. That is, fuel was flowing away from the engine and back into the fuel tank for some reason or another. It probably had to do with weight and balance, the way the aircraft was tilted in the air. So they passed over the, around Nigeria. Then they went out into the Atlantic Ocean. From here, a thunderstorm caused them to have to make a 90-degree 
bank. They had to bank the aircraft almost 90 degrees to avoid going through the thunderstorm. And that particular aircraft, as long as it was fairly lightly loaded by that time, it was able to survive. But if they had to do that back over here, it probably would have broken the wings. So they run up along the coast of South America. Right here it says, Rutan is something by exhaustion. I can't see that. And they continued on here. Then they transitioned from what they were getting. They were getting tailwinds the entire trip. Then they wound up getting headwinds down here in southern Mexico, down around Guatemala in that area. Then finally on up into Edwards Air Force Base. And that's their entire route. That was just, just hard to believe that, that uh, they were able to make it. And so many times during the trip, there were people who were sure that it was not going to make it especially those on takeoff where the engineers were saying, hey, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. They're going to crash. Their wings are going to break off. Something's going to happen. It was so phenomenal an achievement. So here are some of the details of the flight. As we showed with the picture, it's an extremely tight cockpit. Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager were the pilots, started completed, completed the flight at Edwards Air Force Base. Weather was always a serious issue. It took nine days and 44 seconds airborne. It will likely never be done again by anyone. And like a lot of the very first aircraft that achieved milestones, it's hanging in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, the Air and Space Museum. I believe it's either there on the mall or it's at the Dulles International Airport where they have and much larger air and space museum, also controlled by the Smithsonian Institution. Now, I want to go back all the way through. I wanted to be able to go back to the front here and see if I can uh, – pardon? Okay, let's take a break. Let's take a 10-minute break. Go to the restroom if you need to.